Good evening, everybody. This is Mr. Allen, and I'm a principal of Staten Island Tech, joined by Mrs. Liliana Leonforte, our college guidance counselor. And we are so happy and thankful for you to join us here tonight. Uh, I'm going to sign off for a moment and turn this over to Mrs. Leonforte so we can get underway with our financial aid meeting tonight. And I'll be joining us a little bit later on for the Q&A and uh, to send you off for this evening. Mrs. Leonforte, it is all yours. Good evening. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mr. Erlen Wine. Um, tonight we're going to be presenting. We're very lucky to have a wonderful presenter who has given this presentation to Tech uh, for many years now, and he is uh, Mr. Michael Turner. He works for HESC, which is the Higher Education Services Corporation. Um, and um, I just, before we start the presentation, um, I just want to thank everyone for being so proactive as far as um, reaching out if you needed any assistance as far as clarification from last Tuesday night's uh, presentations. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that everyone is doing well as far as getting their yellow sheets together and ready to, for submission. We've had a really nice response so far. So quite a number of students have submitted, obviously for the ones for early action and early decision. So thank you very much for that. And um, I don't want to delay this presentation um, any longer. So I would like to introduce Mr. Michael Turner. Thank you. I'm um, so glad to uh, be joining um, the Staten Island Tech community, albeit virtually. Uh, I've spoken at the school for the last few years in person, and I'm just glad that given the unique times that we're living in right now, that we can still have this forum to discuss uh, the financial aid process and how to pay for college, albeit a virtual one. So um, we're going to go through the financial aid process tonight, and we're going to be covering all different areas of what you need to do to get financial aid to help you pay for school. Uh, this is gonna be including federal resources, of course, what we do for uh, my agency, which is New York State Higher Ed, which I'll tell you a little bit more about in a second, how to navigate what uh, grants and scholarships you may be offered through your college, and of course, uh, private scholarships and kind of everything in between. So a little bit about who I work for, which is called the Higher Education Services Corporation, or HESC. We're a state government organization, so we're part of the state of New York, and we're in charge of uh, administering all of New York State's grant scholarships and student loan forgiveness programs that the state has set aside to help families pay for their higher education. So um, we have programs like the Tuition Assistance Program, which we'll be talking about, or what we call TAP. We also have the Excelsior Scholarship Program that we administer, which I'm sure people on this um, meeting are somewhat familiar with. We'll be covering that as well. So pretty much anything offered by New York State to help families from New York who want to go to college in New York, we're in charge of. So we're an important part of your financial aid process. And we'll get a little bit more into um, how to apply for New York State aid a little later in the program. But first, I want to go through some basics to make sure that you have the foundational information that you need in order to apply for financial aid. And down to the basics, we start with gift aid versus self-help aid. So when you apply for financial aid, some people sometimes confuse financial aid and they think, oh, it's all free money or off uh, financial aid is all just loans and stuff that you have to pay back. Financial aid programs could actually be both types. The free types of financial aid money that you would get, we typically call gift aid, money that doesn't have to be paid back. And it comes in the form of any grant or scholarship offer you may receive. So the TAP grant in New York State is a free program. You receive it, it helps you pay for college. It doesn't have to be paid back. Excelsior Scholarship, uh, there's the federal Pell Grant. Now, just because gift aid is free doesn't mean it doesn't have requirements. So when we have uh, programs like TAP and Pell Grants, they have minimum GPA requirements where students have to be in good academic standing with their college in order to receive their financial aid, their Pell Grants, their TAP Grants, in order for it to be renewed every year. Some programs like the Excelsior Scholarship have even more strict requirements about earning a certain amount of credits while you're in college and also a give back provision where it says that once you've graduated college, you have to live in New York for the same time that you receive the scholarship in order to avoid having to repay the scholarship as a loan. So when you receive a gift aid offer, it's important to know and ask questions like, is this grant or scholarship renewable? Are there any terms and conditions that I need to be aware of? Um, and what do I need to do to apply or reapply to get these programs every year? Now, when your gift financial aid, when your free money is not enough to pay the college, then you may be offered, in addition to your gift aid, what we call self-help financial aid, which are programs that are typically student loans 
and the work study program that are not free money, obviously loans you borrow and you pay back. And the work study program is a program where students can earn a grant, but in order to earn the grant money, they actually have to work for their college through this work study program. So those are examples of uh, basically types of financial aid that are not free that may have to be paid back or earned through, through employment. So um, it's part of the mix. So you clearly wanna be able to look at a financial aid offer and know what's free from what's not free. And of course, everybody wants as much free money as possible. So we'll be covering different kinds of grants and scholarships that you can apply for tonight. There's also another basic concept that you need to know about financial aid is um, how is it being awarded? So, you know, families always ask me, well, how do you qualify for financial aid? Well, it depends on if you're applying for need-based aid or if you're applying for merit-based aid because there's two different types of qualifications. Need-based financial aid is strictly qualified for based on the family's finances. So when you fill out forms that review the family's income or assets, forms like the FAFSA application that we're gonna be talking about in a moment, these forms are designed to review the family's finances and make a determination as to um, how much a family can afford to pay for college and how much need-based aid they qualify for. And on the next slide, we're gonna be talking about what kind of approach, what formula does a college use to figure out if you qualify for need-based aid. So just know that anything that's need-based is based on the family's finances. Merit-based financial aid, on the other hand, is not qualified based on family income. It's qualified based on other criteria such as having good grades or test scores or having athletic ability or having other talents like in performing arts, where a college may award a scholarship to a student based on those types of achievement, not really based on how much their family earns from work. So keep in mind that when you're applying for financial aid, you should be looking into both types of opportunities, need-based and merit-based. Now, families typically are aware of need-based aid and they're really worried as to whether or not they're gonna qualify for it. So when colleges are assessing a family's um, need-based aid eligibility, they're looking at a very simple formula that we call cost of attendance minus expected family contribution equals financial need. Now, the way this works is, is that when you're applying to colleges, all colleges are gonna have different, what we call costs of attendance. So how much does it cost to be a student at this college that you wanna go to next year? Now, every college is gonna charge tuition and fees, if you live on campus, you also have to uh, cover room and board. And then there's all the other expenses of being a college student, like books and supplies, transportation. Every college is gonna make a determination and give you an estimate of what they believe they cost every year. Now, um, from the cost of a college, they're gonna subtract what we call the expected family contribution. Now, this number you might not be familiar with. This is a number that you're given from your financial aid forms, most commonly the FAFSA application where after you submit all of your information on that form, they use a formula to determine how much do they expect your family can afford to pay for college every year before you get any help um, in financial aid. So think of it as the family's responsibility. Now, when you fill out your application FAFSA, which we're gonna talk about tonight, they're gonna make that determination and they'll tell you right away, based on your finances, this is what we think you can afford uh, to, to pay for college. Families typically don't agree with that. You know, sometimes they feel like it should be much less than what they're showing. Sometimes they're wondering how, how do they even come up with that number? But you should be expecting that you're gonna be given this contribution number, which is gonna play a big role because the cost of a college minus how much they expect you to pay for that college, the leftover number is your financial need. So if you have a college that costs $50,000 a year, and you fill out FAFSA and they say, oh, we expect your family can pay $5,000 a year for college every year, then you would have a $45,000 financial need for that college. Now that college can then turn around and give you grants and scholarships and you know uh, other need-based aid opportunities to help meet your need. But the thing that you need to know is that not every college meets the full need of their aid applicants. Some colleges do guarantee. So if you are uh, researching colleges and you know you come from a family who's gonna need a lot of help to pay for college because of your family's financial situation, you wanna make sure that you're shopping for colleges that offer need-based aid, but also make guarantees about meeting your full need. That way you won't be left short where they don't meet your need all the way and they give you just a little bit of money and you're wondering how you're gonna come up with the rest. Now colleges will typically tell you upfront whether they meet your full financial need or whether they don't. So that should be part of your research as you're checking into colleges. Now, some families wonder, oh, what if we have a really high family contribution? What if we're going to have high income, high assets, and that's going to make us look like we can pay a lot of money for college? 
I always tell families just apply because it's hard to estimate what that number is going to be until you fill out the forms and go through the process and they make their assessment. A lot of families are trying to guess all the time. Do we qualify for this? Do we qualify for that? And with this family contribution, it's not a straightforward thing because there is a formula that's being used. And we'll get a little bit into how that formula works when we talk about FAFSA. So I always encourage families of all different incomes to simply just apply and then see how the process shakes out. Now, on the topic of applying for aid, you're going to have four areas to cover of financial aid if you want to maximize your chances of getting as much money as possible to help pay for your college. You got to cover the process of applying for federal aid. You have to cover the process of applying for state financial aid, which for most people here, we're going to be talking about New York state. And then you have your institutional aid, which is basically money that comes directly through your college. So you want to meet their requirements and make sure you do what you, what's required for them to qualify for any kind of grant or scholarship that they may directly offer you. And then lastly, we're going to talk at the end of the night about kind of finding private scholarships, which is money that comes from everywhere else private organizations, scholarship charities, foundations, wealthy individuals, all kind of have these scholarship funds that people can apply to to help find extra free money to pay for their college. Let's start the process tonight by talking about federal aid because this is typically where most students and parents are starting the application process with something called FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, which is your main federal application. It's typically the application that most people start with when they're doing financial aid. And you can actually start applying for FAFSA if you're a senior in the audience or a parent of a, a high school senior in the audience. You can start applying for FAFSA as soon as this coming October 1st by going online to FAFSA's website, which is there in bold, FAFSA, F-A-F-S-A, dot gov, dot G-O-V. And what happens is, is on October 1st, they refresh their website and they open up the 2021-2022 application which is the one that you need to file because your child or the student, your senior is going to be a freshman in college during the 2021-2022 school year. And I can't emphasize that um, enough. Make sure that when you're applying for financial aid, you're applying for next year's application, the 2021-2022 edition, because when you go on there, you may see an option for 2020 and you may see this option for 2021-2022. If you're not in college right now, you don't need to fill out the 2020 version. You need the one that's for next school year, which is 2021, 2022. And that one will be available starting October 1st. Now, if you by accident, some students are very eager. They already started their college process. They're applying for schools right now. And some students may have already applied for FAFSA. If you accidentally filled out the 2020, 2021 version, the, what I'll call the old version of FAFSA, then basically you're giving yourself a lot of practice because come October 1st, you're going to have to resubmit everything again by submitting the appropriate year, which is the 2021-2022. Now it opens up October 1st. Your deadline to submit the FAFSA is going to be set by each and every individual college's financial aid office. So just like you're checking for colleges to find out what is their admissions due date, I need to find out do they have a financial aid uh, due date or deadline that I need to submit my FAFSA for so I can make sure I'm you know, qualified to receive the best chance of getting grants and scholarships from that college. So make sure you know what your college's deadlines are. Now, typically you're filling out one FAFSA form and it allows you to enter multiple colleges. So you don't have to do FAFSA five or six different times if you're doing five or six different colleges. If you have a college that has a really early deadline, you'll just get it done for that school and list your other schools at the same time, and they'll all get it at the same time. Now, one thing you could do now in the days leading up to October 1st is start filling out the accounts that you need to create for FAFSA, which we call the Federal Student Aid ID or FSA ID. What this is, is basically the usernames and passwords that you need to sign in and complete FAFSA. And you also need them to sign off on FAFSA because your student aid ID serves as your legal signature when you're signing the electronic FAFSA form. Now, they require the student who's going to college and at least one of their parents to each create their own FSA ID accounts. And they have a special website where they're going to refer you to if you haven't done so yet. And that's on the screen here, fsaid.ed.gov. And you can actually start building those accounts right now. You create your own username, you create your own password. Parents, you may already have an FSA ID established if you already have children in college, maybe over the last few years, who have done financial aid, who've applied for FAFSA, who've used your information, you might already have an account created. Now you can't create another one. You're gonna have to find out what your old login is 
Sometimes parents created these accounts. Sometimes a student went ahead and created an account for their parent. So if you have an uh, older sibling who's currently in college, you may need to check with them and see if they know the login that was created for you because you can't create a new one. You'll have to do a password reset or, re or recover your account if you have one created for you and you don't remember how to access it. Now, one thing, important thing to note on the topic of FSA IDs is for parents who do not have social security numbers. In order to create an FSA ID, a parent must have a valid social security number. If a parent, for whatever reason, doesn't have one, then you can skip the process of creating an FSA ID for the parent. FAFSA will allow that parent to access the FAFSA and actually sign it using what we call a paper parent signature page, which you would get at the end of your FAFSA if your parent wasn't able to create an FSA ID. But if your parent has a valid social, then they should be making an FSA ID, just like the student. All students who are filing for FAFSA must have a valid social security number and therefore you will be creating um, an FSA ID. So once we get into FAFSA, let's say we're in October now, we're filling out the form online. It may seem intimidating, but a lot of it is actually very straightforward and easy. There's a, a ton of questions about identifying information about students and their parents. So we're talking about names, addresses, emails, phone numbers, really basic stuff. Then there's some questions about eligibility regarding the student citizenship status, regarding their eligibility for federal aid, regarding independent status. Now we're gonna cover and highlight some of the most important eligibility uh, issues with FAFSA in just a moment. Then you have the college list. At some point toward the middle of FAFSA, they're gonna ask you, give us the names of the colleges that you are, ha have either already applied to or will be applying to for the 2021-2022 school year. So that's key words, will be applying to, because they know right now some of you may still be researching colleges, you may still be building your college list, you could still fill out FAFSA even if you haven't yet applied to college. You don't need to be admitted. You don't even need to have applied to college to fill out FAFSA. Now, another thing to know about your college list is they limit it to only 10 different names of colleges. Now, some students, you may be applying to less than 10 colleges. You would be okay. You would be able to submit it for all your schools when you do it the first time. If you're applying to more than 10 colleges, then there's a special process where you have to come back and update your application every few days in order to make sure that each and every college you're applying to gets a copy of your FAFSA. And I'll explain how that works. So let's say I'm filling out FAFSA tonight with my son and my son is applying to 30 colleges. That's a lot of colleges. We're probably very busy filling out applications, but let's say he's applying to 30 colleges. Now, when we're doing FAFSA tonight, there's only going to be 10 spaces. So I can only put 10 names of colleges that he's applying to. What we can do is, is we can put his top 10 choices, or maybe I'll look at their deadlines and pick the top schools that have the earliest deadlines. Once I submit those 10 colleges, FAFSA gets processed. I get an email in about three days saying that my FAFSA was successfully processed and it was sent to those 10 schools that I listed. Now on day number four, I could actually log back into FAFSA, go directly to the college list page, and I could delete the 10 schools that I submitted for the other night who already have a copy. And then I could replace those 10 schools with the next batch of 10 schools that we're applying to, resubmit, and then in about three, four days, those schools will get a copy and I'll get an email saying that they, were, they received my FAFSA. And then I go in and I repeat the process as many times as I need to. I wanna make sure that every college I've applied to has at least one submission of my FAFSA with their name on it. You don't have to worry about keeping a college's name on your FAFSA forever. Once you've submitted it on a day with their name, they get a copy of that FAFSA. The only time you would have to ever relist the name of a college is if you go and change any of the other information on FAFSA, like updating your income or updating something else, where now they need a new copy of your form with your changes. Now, beyond the eligibility and college list, one of the most important parts of FAFSA has to do with the income and asset questions where they're asking both the student and their parents, if the students assume to be dependent, about their income from tax year 2019. So when they're asking parents and students, they're gonna say, did you work and did you file taxes for the 2019 year? Now, 2019 was last year, and that was the most recent full year of income that you could provide for colleges because some parents ask me, oh, what, why can't I use 2020? Well, 2020 right now isn't over. You're still you know, working or earning money for the year. And you won't be doing the 2020 taxes until sometime 
in the winter, spring of early 2021, of early next year. So in order to do FAFSA successfully right now, you have to give them the most complete year of income that you have, which is going to be required for 2019. Now, we're going to talk about the question that a lot of families might have about income changes, especially recently with the pandemic. That's going to come up in just a moment. But let's talk about some of those aid eligibility issues that are important for you to know. FAFSA is going to be asking students, of course, about their Social Security number and also about their citizenship immigration status. In order for students to qualify for financial aid through FAFSA, federal government financial aid, the student has to have a social security number and they also have to be a US citizen or qualified as what we call an eligible non-citizen, which is typically students who have green cards, who have permanent resident status. Now, if a student does not have a social, they're not gonna be able to file FAFSA because technically you won't be able to start an account, you won't be able to log in and do FAFSA. If a student doesn't, if the student has a social but isn't qualified as a citizen or not qualified as a permanent resident, you'll be denied federal aid if they later discover that you're not a citizen or a green card holder. Now, this would typically be students who might have DACA status or might have another type of immigration status, like you're here in the US on a visa, where you're not considered a citizen and you're not qualified as a permanent resident. So you wouldn't want to do the FAFSA process only to later be told that you're going to be denied. You can still apply for other types of financial aid. A little bit later, we'll talk about the New York State Dream Act, which allows students who have DACA or undocumented status, offers you the chance to apply for state financial aid. But keep, the, keep in mind that the federal government has these very strict requirements about citizenship. So you want to make sure that you know whether or not you're going to meet those qualifications before starting the process. Now, this is only required of students. A lot of students say to me, well, I was born in the U.S., but I'm worried about my parent because they don't have that status. FAFSA does not have any questions about your parents' immigration status. FAFSA really cares only about one thing about your parents. Do they make money or not and how much? Um, if, you know, it doesn't matter if your parent just recently came to the U.S. Uh, it doesn't matter if your parent has a citizenship or a green card. All that matters to FAFSA is do they work? Do they make money? How much money do they make? So there isn't any question on FAFSA about citizenship status. Even if your parent doesn't have a social, you're allowed to skip the question about parent social security numbers by simply entering in all zeros and having your parents sign on paper. They just wanna know about your parents' finances. Only students have to meet these qualifications. Now for male students, there's also a qualification about selective service registration where you can be asked if you're registered right now, which is basically with the military draft system in the US. I'm not going to get too much into the details about this, but it is required of all young men between the ages of 18 and 25. And you can learn more about that requirement by going to SSS.gov, which is basically the selective service system. And you can read about why is that required. FAFSA is going to ask you, have you registered yet? And you can also be registered through FAFSA if you've yet to do so. And then, of course, you have to be applying to certain eligible schools. Keep in mind that as you're researching colleges, you may find certain trade or vo vocational programs that may not be qualified for federal student aid. So it's always important to check with colleges to make sure that they're eligible for FAFSA. The other question that we get from students has to do with independent status. And we sometimes get questions about, well, what if a student doesn't live right now with their parents? How do they file FAFSA? And FAFSA has a very strict definition of parents. So when they say parents, they mean, you know, the folks who created you, your mother, your father. They don't mean your grandma who you live with or your older brother or older sister or somebody who claims you on taxes. They're literally talking about your parents, the people who created you. Now, if you're not, you're not living with your parents, a student may be living with another relative or for whatever reason may not be under the care of their parents. You have to be aware of some of these requirements. The first thing is, is that if you're younger than 24 years old, FAFSA is going to automatically assume that you should be providing information about your parents. They're going to consider you to be what we call a dependent student. However, FAFSA will ask you a series of questions throughout the application that will work to identify if you have a qualifying situation that could make you automatically independent and allow you to skip questions about your parents. So, for example, if you tell FAFSA that you're an orphan, both your biological parents have died. Or if you tell them that right now you've been or you are in the foster care system. Or if you tell them that you're living with a relative who's your court appointed legal guardian, meaning that your, your person that you live with, let's say your grandmother, has court paperwork from the New York State Family Court typically saying that she is your legal guardian. 
we wouldn't want you to fill out FAFSA with your grandma. We would allow you to apply as independently. And FAFSA is going to kind of bring you through these series of questions. Now, if you're filling out FAFSA and you're going through these questions and none of them apply to you, let's say you're living with your, your aunt uh, or uncle because of some other reason, make sure you speak to both your school counselors and um, a couple financial aid offices at the college you're applying to and give them a little bit of information about your circumstances and ask for their advice how to apply. There could be special allowances made for you to consider you independent for other special circumstances that FAFSA may not be aware of. Um, so uh, there are some allowances, but in some cases, a college may tell you, well, based on the situation you're telling us, you might still need to use your parents' information. Ultimately, it's decided by your college financial aid office. So if they say you're independent, then you apply without your parents. If the financial aid office says you're dependent, then you're going to need parent information. Which brings us to one of the, the number one questions we get from parents, which is about marital status. And sometimes a student or parent will say, well, if I'm a single parent or I have a single parent, how do I apply? Do I need to provide my non-custodial parents information? So let's say mom and dad used to live together. They were married. And for years now, they've been divorced and they live separately. And you as a student, you live mostly with your mom. Well, the way that it works for both federal and state financial aid, so for both FAFSA and when you do New York financial aid, is that we only want information for your custodial parent. And we define your custodial parent as the parent who you live with most of the time. So if you've always been living with mom ever since your mom and dad split up, then all we're going to need and want is your mom's information. There's literally going to be a checkoff box that says, who are you applying with today, your mother or your father? You're going to check off mother and all the questions are going to ask you about your mom. Now, if for whatever reason your mom is remarried, your mom would have to report herself not as single, but as currently remarried. And you may be required to report information about a stepfather or step parent that you have in your household. So keep that in mind. But if your parent is currently single and she's no longer with your, your other parent, then you can file with this custodial parent only using the parent that you live with the most. And it doesn't matter who claims you on taxes. All that matters is which parent has custody over you. Now, if there's cases where joint custody, where the parents say, oh, the student lives with us at the same time, all that, you know, we just split it 50-50, well, then it does matter then who claims the student, because typically we would say, well, then you have to use the parent that claims the student, because when you claim a student on your taxes, you're saying to the federal government, I'm the one who provides most of the support for this person. And so you would be then the parent that has to file with the student if you're saying you have a joint custody kind of arrangement. Now, keep in mind, while non-custodial information is not required for FAFSA in New York State, it may be required by some of your private colleges. A little bit later, we're going to talk about a special financial aid form they may have you file called CSS Profile. So another big question we get from parents has to do with income changes. Maybe recently because of the pandemic, you lost your job. Maybe you recently retired or are planning on retiring from work, or you have another type of situation which has impacted your income and you feel like your 2019 income taxes are not going to accurately show what your current financial situation is. Well, what you need to know are two important points. The first point is, is that when you apply for financial aid, the forms do require you to report your 2019 tax information, no matter what. The form is black and white. It's going to say, what was your 2019 this? What was your 2019 that? FAFSA even has this link called the IRS data retrieval tool where you could download your taxes and get the information you need from the IRS right onto FAFSA, but it's only going to download your 2019 numbers. Even if you wait to file FAFSA after you file your 2020 taxes, you're still only going to be able to use 2019. So that's the first point. You have to fill it out the way it required, the way it's required. The second important point is, is that once you file FAFSA and you give them your old numbers, you give them 2019, you are allowed to contact each financial aid office at the colleges you're applying to, to ask them for a special review of your income due to your special circumstances. Colleges actually have the authority that if you have valid special circumstances as to why your finances have changed, they can go in and they can overwrite your FAFSA. They can delete your 2019 numbers and they may put numbers that are more favorable to you based on what you're making now or what you will be making in the near future. Colleges do have that ability, but it has to be done through the college financial aid office. You can't do it on your own. Now, colleges have been aware about the economic impacts of the pandemic since spring because it hit their spring students, um, you know, and they know that a lot of those students have started submitting these claims to them of having their family income being changed. 
So colleges may already have a process in place. So what I advise you is before calling a college, just look at their website really quick. Look at their financial aid page. They may already have a description of what to do if you're dealing with job loss or any kind of income change. Maybe there's a form you download and send to them after you file your FAFSA. And another important topic is this expected family contribution. So you get through FAFSA, you submit all your numbers. Well, now what? Well, you're going to have things that are going to make your EFC, your family contribution go up. They're going to think that you can pay more for college because of things like your income, whether that's from your 2019 taxes or other untaxed income resources you're receiving, like certain um, untaxed pension distributions or child support payments that you receive. All your income basically can make your contribution go up. Now, they don't expect you, obviously, to pay your whole entire salary to pay for college, but a percentage of your income will be in your family contribution. Same thing for your assets. They're not going to expect that you're cashing out your savings accounts to pay for college, but a percentage of your savings that you report to them will be included in your family contribution. And not only your savings, they look at investments and they look at real estate, but there are some things that are excluded that you do not have to report. So for example, if you have investments, but they're in retirement assets, if you have a 401k, a pension, an annuity, an IRA, FAFSA tells you not to include that in your asset questions. For real estate, they tell you do not include your family home. So the home that you live in is excluded from FAFSA when they're asking you about real estate. Um, the only thing they're really concerned about are rental income properties you may have or second or other properties like a vacation property, properties that you may own outside of your home. They also do count as part of your assets 529 college savings plans. So if you do have money saved away for college for your children in a 529 type of investment, that is something that's counted as part of your assessment and will be a part of a percentage of that will be in your EFC. Now, there are things that make your EFC, your contribution, go down. And what they're looking at are things like how big is your family? You have a big family. They're not they're going to expect less of your finances. So you might have a lower EFC. If you're sending more kids to college in the same year, that also helps decrease the family contribution because you're paying for multiple college educations. The state that you live in, you live in New York state. That's a high cost of living state. So there is a cost of living adjustment within the FAFSA formula to give people from New York a little bit of a break. Parent age, if you're an older parent closer to retirement age, they're going to try to preserve more of your income and more of your assets, saying that you have to worry about retirement. And then also, if you're in a situation where you may be remarried and your, your uh, step parent in the household is still paying child support for children, perhaps from a previous marriage, child support that they pay out would also be deducted off of the EFC. So these are things that make your EFC go down. Now, you notice there isn't a bullet here for expenses. They do not look at your family expenses. So a lot of people say, well, what about my mortgage? What about my rent? What about my utility bills? What about the other debt that I have for another child I borrowed for their college? What about my credit card debt? What about this? What about that? These are only the things that you see on the screen are pretty much the big things that will decrease your EFC. FAFSA does not collect or assess individual family expenses as part of their assessment. So that's important to know when you're doing this. Because some families might say, oh, our income is good, but we're living paycheck to paycheck. That may not be accurately reflected in FAFSA just because of the nature of the way that they um, ask it the, the questions. Now, also important about FAFSA is what do you get after submitting it? And so these are just kind of a snapshot of all the different federal aid programs that you may qualify for based on submitting a FAFSA. Now, that could be the federal Pell Grant, which is free federal grant money up to $6,345 per year for qualified students and you're qualified based on how high is your EFC. So if you have a really low EFC, if you have a zero EFC, let's say they don't think your family has any money to pay for college, you would typically receive the maximum Pell Grant amount that you see on your screen. The other uh, grant that you can get uh, by way of filing FAFSA is this Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant or FSCOG for short, which is basically a federal grant fund that's awarded through the college um, to students who demonstrate high need, and it could range from $100 to $4,000. You would find out about that award typically later on when your college gives you the financial aid offer because colleges have discretion about who they're awarding that money to and how much they're awarding each of their students. What a lot of families may see from FAFSA are offers for student loans. And there's two types of student loan programs that are available for families. There are Stafford loans, which are for students, and they're plus loans, which are for parents. 
Now, by filing FAFSA, you're automatically qualified to borrow from the federal government, and the student would be able to utilize either a subsidized or unsubsidized direct Stafford loan. So this subsidized, unsubsidized loan is a loan purely for the student, has nothing to do with the parents. The parents don't borrow the money. They don't co-sign for the money. It is the student's debt. They're responsible for paying it off after they graduate. Now, the thing you need to be aware of with subsidized versus unsubsidized is subsidized student loans are a really great loan option because they're interest free while I'm in college. So if I borrow $3,000, $4,000 to go to college through a subsidized student loan, when I graduate, all I owe is three, dollars $4,000. I only owe the principal. But if I borrowed from the unsubsidized loan, then that loan will carry interest while I'm in school. The interest will accrue on my balance. So I'll owe more than three or four thousand dollars. I'll owe that plus the interest for all the years and months that I've been in school if I haven't been making any payments. Students do not have to make any payments until after they graduate. So it's up to you if you want to make payments while you're in school. But if you are borrowing an unsubsidized loan, it does help to at least try to cover interest if you want to keep that balance low. Now, first year undergraduate students cannot borrow an unlimited amount of money from the federal government in their Stafford loans. Typically on a financial aid offer, you would see the subsidized and unsubsidized loan offer at maximum be 5,500. And if you're offered the full 5,500, no more than 3,500 of that will be from the subsidized program. So you might typically see a loan offer that's 3,500 subsidized and additional 2,000 unsubsidized, and that gives you your 5,500 total. You have to have financial need to qualify for a subsidized loan. Remember what we said earlier in our financial aid basics, financial need is cost of the college minus family contribution, and that equals need. Now, if the 5,500 is not enough to, to pay what I owe the college, the college may also offer my family the option to borrow the PLUS loan. Now, the PLUS loan is not borrowed by the student, it's borrowed by their parent. And parents can borrow whatever they need to pay the rest of the college minus any of the financial aid that the student's receiving. But in order to borrow a PLUS loan, a parent has to be credit worthy. They're going to put you through a credit check. Now, for PLUS loan borrowers, they expect that you are paying the loan while your child is in college. And the interest on it is unsubsidized, meaning that the interest will accrue while your child is in school. Now, as a parent, you can ask for a deferment of your PLUS loan bills until after your child graduates, but it's not a good idea because if you're borrowing 10 or $15,000 in plus loans every year and you're not making any payments, by the time your child graduates, you're gonna owe a substantial balance plus a lot of unpaid, uncovered interest. So it's always good to at least cover the interest on a plus loan if you can't afford to pay the full bill while you're in college. I mean, it's a good idea to maybe not have to get into a plus loan if you're worried about your family budget and how you're gonna be able to pay for your day-to-day -day expenses. Are you gonna be able to fit this plus loan payment whenever it's due, either now or down the line, into your family budget with all your other expenses. So keep that in mind. You may wanna go with another college option where you don't have to borrow the plus loan. And then lastly from FAFSA, you have the Federal Work Study Program, which once again, as I mentioned earlier, is a grant that's earned by the student through employment at their college. Work study is optional. So I can opt into it on FAFSA. There's actually a question on FAFSA that says, am I interested in Federal Work Study, yes or no? and I can say whether I wanna be a part of that. Once again, you have to have financial need to qualify for work study though, and we already covered once again, financial need is cost of attendance minus family contribution. But if you wanna learn more about FAFSA and all these federal student aid options, it may seem like an overwhelming amount of information that we just covered. Um, you can always go to their website, studentaid.ed.gov, learn more about the loans, learn more about FAFSA, learn more about the Pell Grant, Learn more about all those qualifications about citizenship and dependency status. All of that is covered very well by uh, the federal government on the studentaid.ed.gov site. And once again, you will have access to these PowerPoints and everything like that um, uh, and a recording of the presentation, um, you know, in case you want to go back and, and pull these websites. Now, what if you want to go to college in New York? Well, that means after finishing FAFSA, now you got to turn over to apply for New York State. Now, there's actually two different ways of getting financial aid in New York. The first way is by applying after FAFSA, if you're qualified for FAFSA. The second way is by skipping FAFSA altogether if you don't qualify and by applying through what we call the New York State Dream Act. And which pathway you take depends on your citizenship immigration status. So if I'm eligible for federal aid and I'm able to file FAFSA, let's say I'm a citizen or I have permanent resident status and I file my FAFSA, 
At the end of my FAFSA, there's going to be a link that says start your state application to apply for New York financial aid. And that allows me to click over and come and start the process of applying for New York state financial aid. I want to emphasize, because sometimes I hear too many students say this, which is false information. Some students say, oh, when you file FAFSA, it automatically applies for New York state financial aid. And the answer is no, that's not true. You could link from FAFSA to the New York state application, but the New York state application is a separate process. So you have to make sure that you're doing both. And this link on FAFSA will allow you to do both at the same time. Now, if I'm not qualified for FAFSA, then what I could do is, you know, I can go right to the New York State website for the DREAM Act, which is hesc.ny.gov forward slash DREAM. And I can just initiate my New York State financial aid application by applying for the New York State DREAM Act. Now, the New York State DREAM Act is not a grant or scholarship. So New York does not offer you a DREAM Act scholarship. New York does not offer you a DREAM Act grant. New York allows you to apply for the same grants and scholarships that all other students can receive. What the DREAM Act is, is just a special application for students who can't file FAFSA due to their citizenship status. So for example, if I'm in the DACA program or on a, I'm undocumented, I won't qualify for FAFSA. So there's no point in me filing it. But if I want to apply for the Excelsior Scholarship in New York State, I can apply for that by going through the DREAM Act application. Same thing like FAFSA, this becomes available for you as soon as October 1st. So if you were to go in there today, you would only see last year's application. So if you are a student who's interested in applying for financial aid through the DREAM Act, wait until October 1st, we'll update it for 2021, 2022, and you can start applying for your New York State financial aid. There are special requirements that you need to meet. So we're gonna be looking at how long have you been in high school in New York, and will you be graduating from high school in New York as a major requirement? Now, whether you apply through FAFSA or whether you apply through the DREAM Act, the first program we want everybody to apply for is called TAP. TAP is one of the largest and oldest uh, state offered financial aid programs in the U.S. And we could provide up to $5,165 per year in a need based grant to families to help pay for tuition for um, study at SUNY, CUNY or even private school, as long as it's in New York State. So you don't have to go just to SUNY or CUNY to get New York State financial aid. Some of our programs like TAP are available at both public and private colleges. But the rule is, is you always have to go to college in New York in order to qualify for New York aid. We do not send our financial aid out of state. Now, in order to qualify for TAP, it's going to be based on the 2019 income. And we're going to be looking at your 2019 New York taxes, if that's if you filed your New York tax returns in addition to your federal. And you have to have an income around 80000 or less to qualify for TAP. Now, I know some families are going to say, oh, oh, my income might be a lot higher than that. So that means I don't get anything. I would say, OK, let's slow down and see what else is available. Now, if a family income is below 80000 TAP might be a big benefit. But if my income is above 80000 then I might want to look into other opportunities that the state offers. And that could be in the form of the Excelsior Scholarship or Enhanced Tuition Award. Now, the Excelsior Scholarship is that free tuition program to study at public colleges, including the public colleges at Cornell and Alfred. And it actually provides up to $5,500 per year, but you also receive these extra tuition credits and tuition waivers that will give you the rest of your tuition free at SUNY or CUNY. It doesn't give you free tuition to go to the College of Agriculture at Cornell or to the statutory colleges at Alfred, but it will give you a similar amount that you would have gotten for free tuition at the average four year schools toward those uh, programs. Now, if I don't want to go to a public college in New York State, I want to go to a private one, then I could look into the sister program of the Excelsior Scholarship. And that version is called the Enhanced Tuition Award. Not every private college in New York offers this. But if I do go to one that does offer it, I can get up to six thousand dollars in state money to help provide for my tuition at the private school. I won't get free tuition to go to a private college, but I'll get a similar dollar amount that I would have gotten if I went to SUNY or CUNY, but in the enhanced tuition award. Now, both of these programs have one main qualification, which is that the student and parent income can be no higher than $125,000 a year. So if my family made based on our taxes or based on our income, whether we file taxes or not, we look at the student plus the parent's income, and it's the same 2019 that we're looking for everything right now. If that is equal to or under 125,000, then the student would be qualified to receive the Excelsior Scholarship. 
Now, um, it's for full-time study only, so I can't go to school part-time unless I'm a student with disabilities. We do allow students with disabilities to receive Excelsior and ETA part-time, but only those students. Students must complete 30 credits per year to remain academically eligible for the scholarship, so there's no minimum GPA while I'm in college, but we look at are you going to graduate in four years, and typically we want 30 credits each year to show that you're on track to graduate within a four-year schedule. And then lastly, as I mentioned earlier in the beginning of the program, this one has a huge string attached to it, which says you must live in New York State. You must agree to this to live in New York for the same amount of years that you went to college under the scholarship for. So if I got four years of tuition to go to uh, through Excelsior to go to SUNY Binghamton, when I graduate from Binghamton, I'm going to have to live in New York State for four years as a give back to the state for paying my tuition. Now, live in New York is the primary requirement. We don't tell students what to do while they're living in New York. The only thing we say is, is that if you work, the job must be in New York State. We get too many calls from parents saying, oh, my kid can't find a job, so what are you gonna make them pay back their scholarship? And the answer is, we didn't tell your kid to find a job. Are they living in New York? If the answer to that question is yes, then they keep their scholarship for free. It's only if the student leaves New York State to move to another state, that then they fall back against their agreement with us and then they have to repay some or all of their scholarship. So that is an important thing to know if you are taking these programs, Excelsior ETA, that you are planning to live in New York um, and that we ask if you do work, it be in New York State um, you know, for that duration of what we call your post-award obligation. Common question I get from a lot of families. So I have two kids going to college next year. What if I make $250,000? Do you folks divide that by two? Can I qualify for the Excelsior scholarship? The answer is no. So parent and student combined income or federal AGI must equal or fall under $125,000 in all cases, no matter how many kids you have going to college next year in order to qualify for this program. Now, if you are interested in applying for Excelsior or the Enhanced Tuition Award, it has a separate standalone application process, and you have to apply for it typically in the spring of your senior year. So we're talking this spring 2021. Um, you'll be able to go to our website. There's a sign up area now where you can get an update from us when the scholarship application opens again, and you can apply for the Excelsior scholarship application. You only need to do this once. Once you're in the scholarship, we renew you as you renew your federal and state application. If you're a DREAM Act student, you can apply for the Excelsior Scholarship same time in the 2021 spring through your New York State DREAM Act application. We'll add that link to do the Excelsior Scholarship on your New York State DREAM Act application. Now, if your family income is way above, you know, the requirements for STEM or for TAP and you're worried you're not going to get anything, New York does have a few different merit-based scholarship options, our most popular one being the STEM incentive program which basically provide free tuition to go to SUNY or CUNY or the same, same dollar amount, the value of SUNY or CUNY tuition I could use as a scholarship at a private college in New York. This one requires students to wanna to study in majors and degrees in science, tech, engineering, or math. And just like the Excelsior scholarship, there's a live in New York requirement after this one as well. And you also have to be employed in a STEM related career in New York state as part of that agreement. Now to qualify for this, we're not looking at family income, we're looking at academics. Students have to apply before they start college and we're gonna check to see with their high school, did they rank in the top 10% of their senior class? Now we don't get into the weeds of whether or not your school ranks or you know how ranking criteria is, is determined, is it weighted, is it not weighted average? We leave that up to your high school. What we do is, is when you apply for the scholarship, which you can start applying for on our website as soon as this coming October 1st, you can actually get a form, of, we call it a verification form. You give it to your school counselor. They fill it out and they verify as soon as they're able to what your ranking is and if you are qualified for this scholarship. We have many other programs on our website that we definitely want you to check out. There's other merit-based scholarships in different uh, career fields such as teaching. There's also scholarships that recognize uh, student or parent military service. Uh, so we definitely want you to look at our website. We have so many other scholarships that we just don't have time to cover all of them in this sitting. Now we've covered federal and state. Don't forget about applying for your college's financial aid by doing any kind of special requirements that they may need. Now, maybe when you're looking at colleges, you're worried that your family income is too high for need-based aid. So then we would tell you to focus on applying to colleges that offer more merit-based aid options. It's gonna be really important to know the nature of your college's financial aid program. Some colleges are purely need-based. 
meaning that they don't offer any type of merit-based scholarships. They only offer need-based aid. So your family income is going to be assessed and they'll help you or not based on your family's financial situation. Now, if I'm worried that I come from a high-income family, I'm not going to get need-based aid, then maybe I want to find colleges that offer more merit types of scholarships, recognizing my good grades or good test scores or other talents that I might have. Now, for colleges that do merit-based aid, it's typically part of the admissions criteria. They're going to tell you what they look for typically in scholarships, and we'll cover some tips to try to maximize your chances of getting a merit-based scholarship from colleges in a moment. But if you're applying to colleges that offer need-based aid, they're going to tell you typically on their website that you have to fill out your FAFSA, and in some cases, a special financial aid form called CSS Profile. Now, CSS Profile is required typically by the more selective private colleges. If I'm applying to SUNY and CUNY, SUNY and CUNY, they don't do this profile thing. I do my FAFSA, I do my New York State applications for SUNY and CUNY. But if I'm applying to NYU, if I'm applying to go to Vassar, if I'm applying to go to University of Rochester, or I'm applying to go to Cornell or Columbia, schools like that typically require the FAFSA and for me to do the CSS profile. Now, just like FAFSA and everything else we've been talking about tonight, it's available October 1st for 2021, 2022. And you're going to go to this special website called cssprofile.org. There's actually a list, the A to Z list on their homepage of the colleges that require this. If you want to look at that list and figure out, do I have to do this for the schools that I'm applying to? This form is not free. It does have fees that are uh, built into the application and the fees can increase depending on how many colleges you're applying to. There is an automatic fee waiver process that if the form sees that you're from a low income family, it will automatically grant you a fee waiver. So some people ask me, oh, how do I get a fee waiver for profile? You just fill it out. When you fill out the profile, they, they tell you whether or not you get a waiver. There's some key differences between FAFSA and CSS profile. And this explains why colleges may want the CSS profile more so than FAFSA. The first one is, is for FAFSA, if, you're, if your parent is single, you are not reporting information about your non-custodial parent. For profile, some of the colleges that use profile, some, not all, may require you to have your non-custodial parent provide their income and their information as part of their assessment. They have something called the non-custodial parent supplement. Now, that is going to be a requirement, not by all, just by some of the schools. Profile will tell you which of the colleges that you're going to be applying to requires the non-custodial parent information and which ones don't. Another key difference is assets. FAFSA excluded your retirement accounts. FAFSA excluded your family home. CSS profile excludes nothing. They want to know about all your home values, whether it's your family home, it's a vacation property, a rental property. They collect all of those home values. They also collect all of your assets, including your retirement account balances as part of their review. It's a much more aggressive asset review than FAFSA. Another key difference that some families like is that CSS profile actually factors in family expenses and debts. So whereas FAFSA didn't ask you about, well, do you owe loans or do you have these kind of debts or liabilities? CSS profile does. They ask you what your mortgage payments are or rent payments are. They ask you about expenses that you have, debts that you might have. So that is factored in and you get more of a full rounded review of your finances, not only what you make and what you earn or what you have saved, but also how you spend that money. Another key difference that you need to be aware of is that once you submit FAFSA, they tell you what they expect you to contribute to college. You get your expected family contribution. CSS profile does not calculate a family contribution. They don't tell you what they think you can pay for college. They send all your numbers to each of the colleges that you applied for profile for, and the colleges will each make their own determinations about your family's ability to pay for school. So you won't find out how much you were expected to pay for college until you get your financial aid offer from NYU, for example. And NYU says, well, based on CSS profile, we think your, fa your family can pay this much, which might be a remarkably different number than FAFSA. So you might have one college who thinks you can pay more based on profile and another college who looked at profile and thinks you can't pay as much. They're going to have different opinions. If you're really looking for merit-based aid as opposed to need-based aid, make sure that you are taking necessary steps to put yourself uh, as a standout applicant at your colleges. And this is really going to, you know, there's going to be three important points here. The first important point is to make sure that you're applying to colleges where you're considered um, a high-ranking applicant. And academically speaking, that could mean being um, a student who typically falls within the top 10% 
of the student body of the admitted freshman class that the school typically brings in. And you could typically, you could find these numbers on college websites. They say, you know, last year, the, the class of the freshman class of 2020, they came in with a low point average of 85 and a high point average of 95. So are you at the top end of that or are you more uh, in the average of that? If you're more at the top range of those averages for those grades, those test scores, that puts you in competition for merit-based aid at that college. The other thing you wanna make sure is that you're diversifying your college applications, not only by, you know, some people diversify college applications by name recognition, which is not a good thing to do. So what do I mean by that? You only apply to colleges that are easy names to drop that, you know, people are excited to hear that you're going to, oh, I'm applying to NYU, I'm applying, you know, to uh, Penn State, I'm applying to these schools that have high name recognition. If you're looking for the best merit-based state, it might be applying to colleges that are less selective, um, that may have lower, you know, more liberal acceptance rates, but you're considered to be a standout applicant where you would boost the profile of their freshman class. So um, if you're looking at colleges that are both selective, moderately selective, less selective, you may give yourself a chance to get a really good merit-based aid offer at maybe those schools that are not strictly selective. And then the last thing that I'll tell you is make sure that you negotiate offers of merit-based aid scholarships from competing colleges. There's some colleges that are similarly, similarly ranked, similarly profiled schools that will both offer you scholarships and College X may be giving you more money than College Y. You may be able to start a bidding war between those schools by calling up College Y and saying, College X is giving me $10,000 more. Why shouldn't I go there? And they might meet or exceed College X's offer. And then you go back to College X with College Y's offer and say, well, they're giving me $5,000 more than you are. And they might match or exceed that. And you might literally start a bidding war between two schools. And in the end, you win because you're going to be saving tons of money through a merit-based scholarship offer. You would typically do this once you have your financial aid offers from the college. So for more information about what's available at your colleges in terms of merit or need-based aid, what the process is, what the forms are, when are they due, uh, make sure that you've thoroughly researched your college's financial aid page on their website. So the last area we're gonna explore before we open up for Q&A are private scholarships. And so private scholarships are basically the, the other money that's out there, whether it's from a scholarship charity or foundation, whether it's from um, some wealthy person, a celebrity who started a scholarship fund for certain students, uh, you know, there's there's big companies uh, that that have scholarships. They use them as tax write-offs. They give away money, um, you know, to families for scholarships. The way that you find these programs is you get online. It could be as simple as going on Google and googling, you know, key terms and adding the word scholarship to it. So search for scholarships based on your family background, race, ethnicity, religion. You could search for scholarships based on, um, you know, parents' employment, professional associations, what major you want to study in what career you want to enter in. If you're a student with disabilities, you could search for scholarships based on a specific disability. Um, you know, there's all these kind of different things that you could find scholarships for. Now, these websites that I've listed here are just some of the many scholarship search engines that are free to use that help narrow down your search based on whatever profile you make on their website, you know, to help you kind of narrow your search to scholarships that you're more likely to qualify for. But I always tell families to start locally Look in your you know, community, see if there's any community-based uh, scholarships. Typically, your local library would be a good place to start. And parents looking at your employer or your union to see if there's any kind of special programs. You know, If a parent says, oh, I served in the military, we'll do some research, see if there's any military foundations that have scholarships for former military members. Uh, you know, There's all kinds of different things that you can find. You know, If a parent works in law enforcement, check with the PBA and the fraternal organizations of police officers and stuff like that. So, you know, what can you do now, kind of wrapping up? Well, right now, before FAFSA comes out, you can do your FSA ID. So you can get that figured out. Or if you need to recover an account, let's say your parent had an account that your older brother or sister made, figuring out how to get into that account. You can get your paperwork together, identity information, figure out your citizenship status, uh, your social security numbers, get that all organized, get your tax returns, everything from 2019, federal and state, W-2 forms, make sure you haven't lost any of that paperwork. And then, of course, make sure you're ready to answer those additional income questions about child support or assets that you may have, whatever your financials are, just have that all kind of laid out so you're ready to apply in October. And then, of course, it helps if you start to narrow down your college list, you know, so that way when you file FAFSA, you're pretty sure about the schools that you're listing. And you don't have to go back multiple times to make updates. 
And then of course, that private scholarship that I was just mentioning before, you can start looking for private scholarships at any time. You don't need to wait until after you do FAFSA. Now let's say we're in November or December and you filed everything, well, what can you do next? Well, just make sure that you review all the output of your financial aid forms. A lot of families, they just submit it and they wait to hear back. You can actually log in and you can get a report from FAFSA to show how it, how it, how it turned out. If you need to make any corrections, they call it the student aid report. You also need to be on the, on the lookout for emails or letters that may come from FAFSA or the colleges or New York State saying that there may be an issue with your application, asking you to submit information to verify things like your income. They may want you to send your taxes. They may want you to send in a different form they send home. So whatever they may need as a follow-up item, make sure you're looking for those requests and you're following up as soon as possible. The goal is, is to get your college financial aid offer as soon as possible. If you're applying for early admissions at your school like EA or ED, you may be getting that in the you know fall or early winter. If you're applying for regular decision, typically college financial aid offers are issued in the spring. And the earlier you get it, then you could do things like negotiate or try to get your merit-based aid offer increased. Or if you have a special circumstance, making sure your college has thoroughly looked at that and they may have to reassess your financial aid package. Whatever it may be, you want to have that offer so you know, you know, before you commit to a college, what the bottom line is going to be in terms of cost. So at this point, we're going to um, open up for Q&A. This is my agency's website and uh, where you can contact us. We do email. You can schedule call appointments with us. We do web chat, you know, at different points due to the pandemic, we've been closed and then open again. But right now we're pretty much running at full strength. So if you do have any questions about New York State aid or financial aid in general, definitely start on our website. And then there's a contact area where you can put into contact us if you want to shoot us a message or schedule an appointment. So with that being said, let's open up for, um, for Q&A. Thank you, Michael. At this point, I'm going to throw the questions from the chat up on the screen. If you could just let me know if you're seeing this. Sure thing. Okay, first question. Oh, yes, I can see it. The first question from uh, Katarina. All right. So the question is, is should I shoot? Should I list all my uh, FAFSA, my schools on FAFSA, that college list? Should I put my college list in alphabetical order or in order of interest? And the answer for Katerina is it doesn't matter how you list your colleges. When you submit FAFSA, the colleges that you list will not know how you listed them in order on FAFSA. They won't know if you're applying to all Ivy League schools. Some students are worried, should I put Harvard or Yale first? Well, they think I don't want to go to Yale if I list Yale number two. When you send your FAFSA to Harvard and Yale, they get a report that says you applied for FAFSA and they don't know who else you applied for, who else you listed on your college list. So colleges are not allowed to see or even know what your college list was on FAFSA. Therefore, it doesn't matter how you list them in, in whatever order you want on FAFSA. So don't worry about uh, having to prioritize how you list your colleges on FAFSA. Just make sure you submit all your colleges the way I described before and get them all submitted at least once. So from um, Jihan, if I'm already uh, filing, if I'm filing already for junior, if I, if I am, so I got to kind of read this. Oh, okay. So if you have a junior in college, do you have to make a new account? I think this is about FSA IDs. So if you have a junior already in college as a parent, do you need to make a new FSA ID account for your senior in high school? Now, the answer is no. If you already have an FSA ID as a parent, and, um, you know, and you use it for a junior in college, you have other children in college who use that account to fill out their FAFSA, you can use the same exact FAFSA account or FSA ID for your senior in high school. But your senior who hasn't applied for financial aid yet, they have to make their own student account for FAFSA. So you already have your parent account set. Just make sure you log in and make sure that you still know your password and then have your senior make their own new account for FAFSA since they're applying for the first time. All right, so our next question from Joanne. Uh, my parents own a second home that they use as rental income and they're a trustee and they do not see any of the income. Uh, will this be an issue when going in and filling out for financial aid? Absolutely, yes, 100%. Just, you know, there's some families that have other real estate and sometimes that's put in the structure of a trust. 
whether it's uh, real estate that you have outright that's not in a trust or real estate that um, is in a trust, both types are viewable, are supposed to be reported on FAFSA. So if I own um, real estate, uh, whether it's in a trust or not, and it's not my family's primary residence, I do have to put the market value of that property on my FAFSA as part of my assets when they ask about my real estate investment property. That's why with FAFSA, when you do it, you'll notice for the um, investments question, they simply lump everything together. There's one line on FAFSA that says, tell us what your investments are, the current market value of your investments. And within that is going to be your real estate, your mutual funds, your money market accounts. Yes, your trust funds, your 529s, because they don't get into the, the details of, oh, where is it? You know, what's the nature of the of the investment that you have? How is it structured? Is it just a property or is it in a trust? They all they consider all of that to be um, reportable information. So they're going to have you kind of lump sum all of that together. So the answer to that is, is if you do own an additional property, that deed is in your name um, and um, you are collecting rental income, even if you weren't collecting rental income from it and you're not getting any of the funds from that uh, because it's all being put into a trust, it's still an investment real estate property, still has to be reported on FAFSA. And when you report real estate, we're reporting, if I sold that property today, uh, what would it be currently worth on the market? And then I could deduct from that any liability on that property. So if I still owe mortgage, I could subtract that from the market value. You can go to the next question. So from Jennifer, um, when do you find out if your child is getting the Excelsior scholarship or the private college equivalent, which we call the enhanced tuition award? So typically, um, if you apply in the spring, what we do is, is we verify if the family income is eligible. We verify if the student has um, in, enrolled at the college that they listed. And then we would let the family know that they um, are eligible. Typically, you have to commit to colleges by May 1st. So decisions for Excelsior would start rolling in after May 1st when colleges can tell us, oh, yes, they applied for Excelsior at SUNY Albany and they've signed the commitment letter to go to SUNY Albany and that's where they're going to be going. So we need that verification because too many times we get people saying, oh, yeah, I'm going to go to SUNY and they decide they want to go to private school. So we need to know exactly where they have um, decided to enroll. And that typically happens after May 1st. Now, if you applied for Excelsior last year for the class of 2020, Excelsior was completely screwed up because of the pandemic. It didn't come out in the spring. It came out in the summer. And there's all these questions now about Excelsior uh, and the viability of the program due to the current budget crisis. So there's a lot of questions I can't answer yet about whether funding for students this year is going to be impacted or is funding next year going to be impacted for Excelsior. Those are things that we're going to learn in the coming days as the state starts to figure out its budget situation. We expect to still offer folks the opportunity to apply for state programs, but if there are changes in the amounts, if there are changes in how much we award, we'll be updating our information as we learn those things because, of course, we do not make those decisions. Those decisions are made by the governor and the elected officials in, in, uh, in the state Senate and state assembly. So you can go to the next question. So Jihan with a follow up. So um, if my child accepts TAP, does he have to work in New York after graduation? So TAP is a free grant without any of those kind of strings attached. So TAP is one of the best grants to take from New York because we don't ask them to live in New York after they graduate. We don't ask them for TAP to uh, be in a certain major or have a certain uh, career when they finish college. TAP is just a grant that you earn based on your family income. And if you're qualified, it pays your college. The only thing we require really for TAP is that the students maintain a C average, which is a 2.0. So you can go next. So Jennifer, again, if I apply for early action, do I find out sooner what financial aid you're getting? And typically, yes, but also be aware that you may have early deadlines for um, early action. So if I'm applying for early action, you're going to have a really early admissions deadline to get everything in. And they're going to have probably a coinciding very early financial aid deadline to get your FAFSA and profile or whatever else. And the goal is, is that to give you an early financial aid offer when you get your early admi admissions offer from the college. So yes, you will find out sooner. Now, it doesn't mean that you have more priority. Some people think, oh, I have to apply early action so I can get more priority over financial aid than other people. Colleges will typically reserve a budget for regular admission and for early action, early decision students, but it does give you that lead time that you need to find out, am I admitted to a college early and are they giving me a good offer? And early action is the non-binding version of admission, 
So if that financial aid offer is not good, you have some time to negotiate that with the college. And if it doesn't fall to where you need it to be, then you can always decline through early action. If you do early decision, uh, early decision is binding. So even if you're not happy with the financial aid offer you get from that college, you've by, by virtue of applying for early decision have locked yourself in um, for uh, attending that college. So definitely make sure you know those differences between EA and ED types of admissions because it, you know the financial aid implications are huge. So from Derek, does private scholarship affect need-based aid? That's a very good question. Now, the answer is it depends on the college's policies about private scholarships. So when you win a private scholarship, let's say I win $10,000 from Microsoft for a scholarship to go to college, I have to tell my college about it because typically most colleges, um, the scholarships will pay to the college, not to the student. And so once the college learns and I'm getting a $10,000 scholarship from Microsoft, they may reserve the right to go into my financial aid offer, the scholarships and grants that they've given me, and they may cut it down by $10,000. It typically has to do with, did the college meet your full financial need or not? So remember very early on in our financial aid basics, we said, if you're going to a college that costs $50,000 a year and you fill out FAFSA and they say that you can afford to pay $5,000 a year for that college, then your need at that college is $45,000. Now, if the college only gives you $30,000 in grants and scholarships, they don't meet your full need. And then all of a sudden you win a $5,000 scholarship. Typically, the college wouldn't cut back your other financial aid because you still have room for additional money because the college didn't do a good job in meeting your need. But if the college did meet your full need, if they gave you a $45,000 scholarship and now you're bringing a $5,000 scholarship to the table, some families say, oh, hey, great. Now I got the rest of the money that I need to go to school for free. The college will say, no, sorry, this scholarship counts towards your need. So we're going to reduce our scholarship from 45 to 40. We're going to take your $5,000 scholarship and you still owe us $5,000 at the end of the day to cover your contribution. So, yeah, you want to find out the policy of your college. It's a very good question. So from Marina, uh, my oldest son graduated from college more than 10 years ago. Do they keep the FSA ID for that long or do we have to find it? 10 years ago, they didn't even have the FSA ID. 10 years ago, they used to have something called the FAFSA PIN. So what it was is like a, a PIN number, like a four digit secret code you used to use to log into FAFSA. They scrapped that like about five years ago. So um, you would just go in and make a new FSA ID because I'm sure you're no longer in their system. So you can go ahead with the next question. So Derek, you can, I, I guess you, you, this would be answered by the school. So, Mrs. Leon Forte, Derek has a question. Uh, will Tech, Staten Island Tech provide a top 10% ranking when we apply for merit-based aid scholarships? We don't. We have a non-ranking policy for admission. Um, when we do have to supply a rank, it does not. Um, it's not favorable because of the high caliber of our students and their um their gpa uh we we try to do um an outreach to the organization that is um giving out the merit base and i try to explain to them the non-ranking policy so it it's on an individual basis All right, and, and that basically wraps up the Q&A for tonight. Um, I want to thank uh, Michael Turner for joining us once again this evening and in, uh, in sharing with the Staten Island Technical High School community um, all the ins and outs of the financial aid uh, <clears throat> part of the college admissions process. So thank you, Michael, for joining us tonight. And uh, I want to thank Mrs. Leon Forte for organizing this event yet again. Uh, despite any barriers, whether it be in person or remote, here we are coming together once again. I also would like to thank Mr. Turner. He's been um, a great friend to tech all these years by giving his time in the evenings to give this presentation to our students and their families. Michael, thank you so very much. Thank you both. And thank you for having me. And thank you for um, organizing this despite the challenges of being virtual. I think this ran very smoothly. Likewise. Thank you. So uh, thank you all for attending another uh, 
Tech Talks. Uh, we hope to see you soon in the next week or so with uh, more information about the upcoming uh, school year as in-person learning begins next Thursday. Thank you. Have a great evening and see you soon. So long, folks. Good night. Good night.